Good morning. Can we turn the, the mic on real quick? All right, now we got everything. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I have we got a opposition sign-in sheet. We don't have the opposition sign-in sheet. I, I just I, sent it to Ms. Bull. This, this is support. Is this this is opposition here? Perfect. It just hasn't come yet. Uh, email's probably being a little bit slow this morning. Uh, if you would just get a sign-in sheet on the media outlets that are here, uh, just for the record, not in support and opposition, but just so we know who's in the room, that's all we need. We haven't got our sign-in sheet yet. It just hasn't showed up. But is there three in opposition uh, that will be speaking and then the general? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And can the camera won't, is not focused very well at all. Can you maybe zoom it in just a little bit for us? Uh, I just want to give the folks that are speaking the uh, respect they deserve to allow me to at least see their face. I'm guessing that General Wyrick, uh in the back, but I yes, just Rich, because of the, okay. Mr. That, it, it's just yes at this point. Mr. Rich, the camera zooms in on its own. We don't really have the capability to zoom oh, in. Oh, there. You, well, no, it zoomed just in, and now it, it okay. needs to be moved over a little bit. It zooms in as whoever is speaking. It'll zoom into their face. All right. Yes. Very good. Let's let's see if that works now. Okay. Well, and I can tell you, Mr. Rich, there's no one seated to my left. Speakers to my right that helps orient you. There we go. It, it, it took it just a minute, but it zoomed over to you there, General. Now I can see you. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. And you? Good, good. So, uh, before I'm going to explain this during the hearing once we go on the record, but uh, I'm going to allow the victim's uh, family, four family members or victim's family to speak, and then, General, I'm going to reserve uh, some time after they get done uh, for you. Thank you. For the that's generally how we do these things. We let four opposition, four in support, and then uh, we make exception for the state to have their side. I haven't got to it yet. Uh, we send it to Heather yeah. Okay, we still haven't got the sign in sheet yet on the opposition. Okay, I'll send it again. Okay, heather.doyle at tn.gov. Okay. And I assume, Ralph, we're just waiting on the prison to get here. And we've emailed them to ask them to please join us. Okay, I sent it again. Okay, we just got it, and we're just waiting on the prison to come in. We've uh, asked them to join us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? How are you today? Doing very well. Good. Okay, we are ready uh, for Ms. Wright to come in uh, okay. and with support. Do we have any media outlets there? Yes. yes. Yes, we do. Okay, all we just need to do is get a sign-in sheet uh, for the record so that we know everyone that's in attendance there. Okay. Um, certainly, they don't need to be listed under support or opposition. They just need to be listed as, as a media outlet. Okay. 
And we're just going to okay. upload that so we'll have it for the, to preserve okay. the record. Okay, I got some, some blank paper. Okay. So they don't need to be on the... You said they don't need to be on the board of opposition, okay. just me and you out okay. All right, so we'll work on getting those to you uh, just a second here. They don't already have the same your, your visitor's registry is fine. We just got that. Uh, we got that from Memphis. The way, what they did was just a visitor's registry. So that will be fine uh, to list okay. it under that. Okay. Just to make okay. it easy. I know no one wants to be signed on, on a support or opposition signing sheet with me. Just, we just need a okay. record. Know who's there. All right. Just, just a second here. He's ready for them to come in. Yeah. I can get them all. Good morning, everyone that's joining us from the prison. We'll be with uh, you all in just a moment. We're just preparing uh, some recording devices and we'll be ready to go in just a minute. Mr. Rich. Yes, ma'am. We, we've had two people here to a call, so could we have a couple of minutes to rearrange our room? Sure. Absolutely. Right, thank you. Uh, we just need to know, we just need an opposition sign-in sheet uh, for those that are there in person to oppose. Okay. 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 We're going to need two people in support mm -hmm. on this side. So you can roll your chair. This is it. Yeah. Uh -huh.
Hey, Mr. Cato. Yes, sir. Is there somebody mowing grass in the hallway? <laughs> We're getting, we're getting rid of the lawnmower. Yeah, we're next to the window, uh, so mm -hmm. the word says they're, they're about to. I've instructed to turn it off. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. The only thing we're waiting on right now is a sign-in sheet on the opposition. They just can't. Send again now. Okay, thank you. Okay, the sheet, just the uh, signing sheet just came through. We're printing now. Who's our victim witness court there? Okay. All right. Uh, I believe we're ready to get started now. Mr. Rich, uh, may I ask a question for you? Please. I, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Mr. Cato. Okay. Um, Ms. Wright has asked if some information can be sent to you. Okay, sure. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're ready to get started right now. Um, so, everyone, welcome to the parole hearing for Shara Wright. Today's date is May the 11th, 2022, and this is the initial, meaning first, parole hearing for Shara Wright. Ms. Wright, can you give me your inmate identification number, please? 610305. And your date of birth? 2 1 of 1971. Okay, that makes you 51 years of age, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, I am parole board member Barrett Rich, and I'm hearing your case today from the Deborah Johnson Rehabilitation Center via video conference from officer here in the state. Has your IPO met with you to explain to you your rights in the parole hearing process that will occur today? Yes, sir. Okay, so you understand that if you get a declination of parole, you have a limited right to appeal that? Yes, sir. Those rights are limited indeed, and they are set forth in Tennessee Code 40 28 105. The rights the only way you can appeal that is if there is significant new evidence or information that was not available at the time of the hearing, if there are any allegations of misconduct by the hearing official that are substantiated by the record. And I believe with all the media I'll see today and on top of our recordings, we're going to have plenty of record of this hearing. Um, and third, if there are any significant procedural errors uh, by the hearing official that are substantiated by the record. Of course, we're going, uh, everything we're doing here today is on the record uh, will be recorded. The purpose of this hearing today is to gather information from you, your records, and your guests that are here and make a decision on whether to grant or deny your parole. Your case requires three votes to parole or not parole you. At the end of this hearing today, you will know my vote. After I vote, the other board members will review your case and other kind of credit may require a number of votes to reach. Once the required number of votes to reach, you'll be notified if you've been granted or denied parole. Again, if you've been denied parole, uh, there are there is a appeal process However, it is limited, as I just stated before. Visitors, everyone is welcome at this hearing. Uh, at an appropriate point during the hearing, I will hear from four members of Ms. Wright's support, and I will hear from four in opposition of Ms. Wright's parole. Uh, generally leaving the last uh, say to the state of Tennessee. All right, Ms. Wright, I have viewed your file. I'm going to go over a few things for the record here today. You're being seen today on the conviction of facilitation of first degree murder and attempted facilitation of attempted first degree murder out of Shelby County uh, that occurred in uh, July and April of 2010. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and your sentence effective date uh, is January the 20th of 2018. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Um, but I actually was extradited from California on December the 15th, 2017. Okay. And none of my records show that or that time hasn't been calculated in. And I, I'm not understanding why. But Okay. All right. And you received a 30-year sentence. Your release eligibility date um, is the, not until June of 2025. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, and you expire your sentence uh, on June 30th, 2046, currently. I believe that sounds correct. Okay, and of course, with good time, that does change, uh, and the records do change on the exact release dates. Uh, so you have served approximately just over four and a quarter years um, in prison. I show your custody level to be minimum restricted. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do show your strong R to be as of low risk. Your co-defendant in this uh, case is Billy Turner. Is that correct? Uh, well, he was. I thought we were. I was separated from him at, at the point where I took my plea. Okay. Well, yes. E even though you you separated, he committed this crime with you, and that's in, in large part of the greater conspiracy. Billy Turner. Uh, was also convicted as a result of this set of facts, circumstances, or events. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And I believe he just received a life sentence. So you have a 12th grade education from Westwood High School, and uh, you are a cleaner in the free world. Uh, your prior adult criminal record shows you have driving with license suspended, broken, canceled two times, reckless driving, uh, and minimum speed regulation. Definitely some, just some traffic charges other than the more serious driving on suspended vote to cancel. Uh, your felonies include conspiracy to commit felony upon person along with these 
other two charges. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I sure you've been a call center representative at your institutional job. Is that right? Yes, sir. My previous job. Okay. Do you work in while you're in your uh, incarceration? Do you work there at the prison? Oh well, no, I'm not able to because I'm, I attend two colleges at the same time. I uh, attend TCAT, which is Computer Information Technology. I graduate in two weeks from there, and okay. I attend Nashville State in the evenings. And okay. um, I'm close to receiving my associate's degree in business administration, so I'm not working. Okay, very good, very good. I think that is an excellent program that National State offers. I show, have shown you to have completed grief management, CVF, a journey to emotional freedom, freedom from trauma's imprint, uh, certified PC pro, certified IT fundamental pro, boundaries, domestic violence, victim impact, anger management, tricor, life skills, adult basic education, and whole child initiative. Is that right? Uh, and I've also completed parenting in the last week or so. Okay. Thank you. I think that may be is that the whole child initial initiative of parenting. That's what it shows. Okay. okay. Uh, what is your marital status? I'm married. You're married currently. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, tell me about your children. Um, I have six children. Uh, two of them are actually somewhere in Tennessee, wrongly found uh, lost. They were supposed to be at the parole here, and they drove from Illinois. And they're identical twins. They will graduate from college next year and go on to play professional ball. Um, they have some overseas looks right now, but they're um, trying to go to the NBA. So those two are actually lost. They should be here. I think they wrote letters on my behalf, but they weren't able to be here yet because they're lost. And, and I have I have read letters uh, from so yes, what, what were their names? Uh, Lamar and Shamar, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're 22. And then my oldest is 27. He's present. He's Lorenzo Wright Jr. Um, and he had just had an over-the-phone interview with a, a college this morning for a coaching position. And he's working on, he's about one semester from his master's degree um, in organizational leadership. Then I have Lauren Wright. She's 25. And she is five, way, uh, five months away from being a registered nurse. I put her through nursing school. And then we have uh, Lawson, who is uh, soon to be a high school graduate. And so he couldn't make it because they're doing graduation um, exercises right now, and he has to finish up on his finals. He'll be going on to uh, information technology. He wanted to follow in my footsteps in that and his uncle's footsteps. Uh, so he's been accepted, and he'll be starting college in about, um, you know, in August when college starts. And then the baby is Sophia, and she's 15. She's present today, and she is doing well in um, middle school. She's going on to high school. She'll be a freshman next year, and she's a, a really good athletic person. She plays volleyball and basketball. Okay. All right. Well, so should you be released from prison, where would you go? What would you do? What is your release plan? Um, I decided to... Um, First, go to transitional housing here in, Na in the Nashville area because there were some really good counseling programs for people that experienced domestic violence, things like that, trauma. Um, and that representative, she's here today. I was accepted into her housing program, and she's here today. She would like to speak on my behalf if that's possible. Um, and she has an eight-month program, and I think that would really um, help me get acclimated back into society. Um, and there's some really good job programs that she has to get us back, you know, on our feet and get us started. And um, I'm really excited about that, if given the opportunity. Okay. All right. Well, I like to so you, you will get four people to be able to speak. Whomever you wish to speak on your behalf uh, will certainly be uh, one of the four be allowed. Okay. And uh, by the way, I have read uh, what you have sent me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We've, we've also checked your certifications, your records, and, and just reviewed everything. All right. At this point in the hearing, I want to know what happened. If I can use a, a reference that you hear in many sporting events, the play-by-play, -play, I need to hear what exactly happened 
that led uh, to your incarceration, to you being here in front of me, committing these uh, horrendous crimes and being here today. Everything started, um, the crimes actually started before the crimes actually started in my mind because there was a lot going on in our family, in our life um, together, which actually eventually led to a divorce. Um, there was a lot of um, financial distress. Uh, Mr. Wright, um, my ex-husband Lorenzo, he um, got involved in the drug ring and there were some people that we owed money to great amounts of, well, he owed money to great amounts of money. And during that process, um, I decided that I couldn't handle that because it actually led to a lot of pressure and a lot of beatings and a lot of things. I mean, there was uh, some suicide attempts on his end and it was just too much. And I didn't, I was trying to get the kids away from that type of uh, environment because that's something that they weren't used to. Um, I filed for a divorce. I moved away um, from Lorenzo at that time, uh, but he needed my help. So he reached out to me. He was like, after one of the guys that was driving for him to go pick up his dope, he ended up, they ended up coming into like an opposition with one another and he became the enemy of ours and that money needed to be paid back to the people that they were working for because they were arrested and his, the, the guy's family needed his money. And so at that point, um, we owed, when the money was owed, it was owed by t the two of them, the young person that what you've read, and it was owed by the two of them. And so he couldn't handle the pressure, so he went ahead and paid the part for, Ms., for my ex-husband. And when that made us owe him, and so he put pressure for us to get the money to him and my cousin, Jimmy and Billy, they both were working. Um, Jimmy would go to Florida and pick up the dope and Billy was doing the more local transactions. He wasn't doing the Florida runs. Um, there was a lot of animosity between both of them. It was power plays between Jimmy and Billy because one of them wanted to be the man and one of them wanted to make the most money and it was a lot of chaos. Um, leading up between to Mr. Rogers, Jim, between Billy and Jimmy? Yes, it was. It was like power plays competition, like who's going to be the closest to Lorenzo and who's going to get the best jobs, who's going to get the most money, that type of thing. And Jimmy wasn't making mo a lot of money because he owed us for attorney fees that we had paid for him. And also Lorenzo bailed him out of jail on his murder charge. Um, Leading up to the murder, we got, um, my son was approached at his school and he was threatened, Lorenzo Jr. was approached at his school and he was, and his life was threatened. And they wanted to, his dad's whereabouts because they, because Lorenzo went into hiding. While all this was going on, it was a target placed on me and my kids' heads and people were knocking on our doors looking for him. And at that point in time, Lorenzo began hiding out. So we didn't, I didn't even know where he lived. Um, but with the two of them being able to work for him, they knew where his address was. So when the knock came at the door, I called everybody in. I was like, look, he wants his money. How much money do you guys have? Where, where um, was he at this time? He was in Atlanta. He was located, Lorenzo was located in Atlanta at that time. Okay, that's, that's what I was just making sure of. Now, did you and visit that, him? Excuse me? And you visited him in Atlanta after you were divorced, right? Only once. Yeah, now, I really, I picked up the kids from Atlanta uh -huh. once I was divorced from him. They went to his house, and, and that day when, well, we'll get to that, but in that particular, um, but yes, I visited once in Atlanta. Okay. Not and, and really that, visited. That, I that, that when you left the window open? No, sir, that never happened. That never happened? That never happened. So the state... State's not accurate in that. Uh, Every house that Lorenzo lived in, or whatever, once I went to Atlanta, I was given the keys to that home just in case anything happened. All of my stuff was still in his garage. I had, um, he had all his stuff in his garage. He was hiding out. He was like, anything happens, you know, you need the keys to that place. And he okay. gave it to one of the children to give to me. So that 
that never happened on locking his windows. As a matter of fact, the day that we went to the Atlanta to his home, I went. He met me at the gas station because I didn't know how to get there. And okay. when I followed him to the house, the kids, he was like, the kids are in the pool. I didn't want to take them out. So meet me at the gas station, and then I'm going to bring you into the... And if you looked at his townhouse complex, it was a whole lot of townhouses, and the entrances to the doors were from the back of the uh, townhouses and not necessarily from the front. And I never even went inside of his house, so there was no way to unlock the windows. I picked the kids up from poolside. Okay. I never right. even went inside his home. Okay, well, just, you better continue with, with what you were beginning to say. Okay, yes, sir. Um, in the process of them working for him, uh, there was, uh, and, and when they came to my son's school to threaten him, that particular day, I called everybody into the house and I said, "Do what? What kind of money do you have on you right now? What do you have? What have you made? What do you have right now?" And because this guy wanted his money, and he said he was going to kill my kids. So at that point in time, everybody started drawing weapons and, because he's at the meeting too. And so there, every, and I understand why nobody's talking about that, but it needs to be talked about. Everybody had drawn their weapons. I was like, ho, ho, ho. And I made everybody lay their guns down on the table at that time. And I said, what are we going to do? My cousin was throwing out some, I took my diamond earrings out of my ears. I said, take these earrings. Um, I have a divorce um, money that's coming. It'll be here in just a couple of weeks or maybe even a, no later than a month. Can you wait for a month? He was like, no, I can't wait. I got my own stuff going on. And at that point in time, Claudia, my cousin that was at the house, she started throwing out things like, um, well, we can just, why don't we just um, send him to Atlanta and he can talk, Lorenzo's not here, you need to talk to him. And my cousin's like, nah, um, he, um, I, I ended up saying at that time, Jimmy got mad at me because at that time I was like, nah, you take this away from my porch and put it on their porches because I don't have anything to do with this. I don't have anything to do with his money missing. I don't have anything to do with drugs. I don't have anything to do with this. So I hauled off and I threw out Jimmy Mama's address. I said, you can take this to 205 Draper Street or either that or you, what you can do is, and he was like, nah, what you need to take it into is that insurance policy that you got on him because you can um, pay him that way because I'm not going to die. I'm not going to be caught up in this. And I was like, well, you know what? This is what we're going to do. Everybody's going to get out of, away from my kids and off my porch, and everybody, and he's going to handle his own business and his own debt. And that, then I start hauling off and saying things like, yeah, so if it's going to, if you think it's going to be me and my kids, no, nah, it's going to be him. Take him to, take him to them. I told them to take him to Lorenzo. And so that's how I, sent them, so I sent them to Atlanta, and he was like, I can't go right now, blah, blah, blah. And so what I wanted to do was, I had four, five of the kids, only one kid was at home at that time, Lorenzo Jr., and the other kids were with their dad. And so that's why I ended up um, at the pool picking them up first. I never warned Lorenzo, and I should have done that, but I did not warn him when I got there because I was angry with him. And I shouldn't have been angry. I should have compromised. I should have tried to tell him. Maybe I should have told the police or something. But I was afraid. And I was afraid for my kids' lives. And I was afraid because I knew that there were drugs on hand. I knew that I, I felt like I was putting them in a, a worse position because if they pulled up, that they would find those drugs on hand. Then I kept thinking, maybe I'll get caught up in a drug scheme. And I, I didn't want to do that. And so that's how that the first part of the um, the crime happened. Okay. That, moving, that. Into the sec moving into the second part of the crime, I began to, um, once they went to the house to, to find him, he wasn't there. And he came back to my house and he was like, so now you're playing games with me. And in a way that was true because when they went to Atlanta, I knew that um, that my son had a basketball game in Little Rock, Arkansas. So I figured, well, at least that'll buy us a little bit more time, maybe, you know. And he said that I was playing games with him. And then he said, well, he was going to take my baby Sophia 
for a ride if I didn't give him, if I didn't show him proof that I was trying to cooperate because he didn't believe anything that I was saying. So that's when I text Lorenzo and I tried to get some dates from him on as to when he was coming home um, so that he can, you know, handle his business and pick up his money and do what he was supposed to do. Um, and then at that time, I got July 18th, and that was the date. And after that, I kept blowing up everybody's phones, blowing up Billy's phones, blowing up Jimmy's phone. And I was like, look, we need to have this money here by the 18th. I think all of that was captured in text messages. Um, Jimmy was on his way back from Florida at that time. That was captured in uh, Facebook messages. Um, he had just picked up some dope and he was headed back and we were trying to figure out how much he said he was going to get rid of the big part of it and that he just had one more part of it to uh, get rid of. So he talked about a big keyboard and a little keyboard. And then we talked about um, the 18th, telling him it was too late to turn back. We, I needed the money and um, to, I was just trying to put pressure on him because he was the one that was making the majority of the transactions. Mm -hmm. After that, Lorenzo made it home on the 18th as scheduled, but I kind of got zeroed out of the plan because when he got home, I was supposed to pick him up from the airport. And I think that was captured in text messages as well. I was supposed to pick him up from the airport and then we were supposed to shoot to go pay the people off. But the thing was, is Jimmy never brought me the money. So that kind of put Lorenzo in a bad position, and it made him angry not only at Jimmy, but at me. Um, and that day, he didn't even want to talk to me. He says, I got another ride from the airport. I'm going to plan B, F you, this and this and that, F your cousin, this and this and that. Y'all going to get me killed out here, that type of thing. So that was the whole situation on that morning. I didn't hear from Lorenzo again, even though that transaction was supposed to go down that morning. I never heard from Lorenzo until about four or five, four or five that evening. And during that time, I figured, well, maybe he shot to the baby shower or maybe he did uh, run into my cousin or whatever. I thought that he was going to pull up on him and go get his own money. And I, we had an argument about that earlier that day. Um, and at that night, and I didn't see him again until at night. I mean, I never saw him when he got to town. I never saw him. Everything that I had planned, or everything that was planned for the exchange to pay the money off, it never even happened. And because at nine o'clock, when he gets to the house, after he picks Lorenzo and Junior up from the gym, he tells me that he wanted to discuss some good news with me. And I thought the good news was going to be that everything was handled. But the good news was is that the Houston Rockets, um, he had tried out with them, and he said something about $1.6 million a year for the next three years. I got excited about that. And then when I tried to bring up Jimmy's name or what happened earlier, he pushed me in my face. And when he did that, that means just to don't say anything else to him or ask him any more questions because if I did that, then, you know, that led to beatings when I opposed anything that he said to me. Um, so I went on and went to bed, and he woke me up, and he said, listen, he said, I'm sorry about putting my hands on you. He's like, but I'm getting ready to go. He said, I'm going to grab this $110,000. He was like, your cousin got me effed up. He said, I'm gonna tell you that right now. And if this don't go, and if this don't go the way that it's supposed to go, he said, I'm gonna eff you up when I get back. He was like, but I'm gonna tell you right now. He said, call. He said, matter of fact, you gonna go with me. So he called, told me to call the babysitter Teresa Walker, and that should be in my phone records. I called Teresa Walker. She didn't answer the phone. I said, well, I can't go because I'm not going to leave the kids because these people, you know, were in and out from our home. And I was like, I'm not going to leave the kids, so I can't go. So he asked me then. He was like, well, text Billy. Tell him to meet me there. And that's what I did. And I never saw him again after that. And then what? After that, I mean... He, after that, he's missing, and I'm, I'm scrambling. I'm asking questions. 
I'm pulling up on my cousin and asking him questions, and I could tell that he was hiding something from me. I'm asking Billy questions, and I could tell he was hiding something from me. And I was like, well, we could just go to the police and tell them. And, they, and both of them, they, they kept saying, no, because of the drugs and stuff, that's going to get us a drug charge. And they kept saying, no, nah, just you need to wait it out. And Jimmy was just lying the whole time. He was just lying the whole time. Like, things have happened to let me know that he was lying the whole time. We had a family reunion, and it was a lot going on. And I, him and I ended up getting into a fight at the family reunion because I told him that he was lying to me. What was he lying to you about? Just everything. Like, he was saying that he didn't... Uh, he didn't, he don't, I, I already gave him, I, I, I took the money to him. I took the money to him that night. And I'm like, okay, so why come ain't nobody heard from him? He just, I just, feel, I just felt like in my spirit that it was something like really bad. I even spoke with his mother during that time. And she was like, well, if you get locked up, uh, you know that insurance policy and stuff, all of that can come to me. It's going to go to me and I'll take care of the kids for you. You don't have to worry about anything. I just felt like he was plotting behind my back. It just didn't feel right. So, out of all that, did you know, did you plot and conspire to kill your, your former husband? No, indirectly, yes, sir. But well, no, but that, I don't have indirectly by the facts of the offense from what I have, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, and I'm not relitigating this case. You're already convicted. However, uh, yes, I do have to determine if you've done an appropriate amount of time with, and if there's any aggravating mitigating circumstances yes, sir. Uh, here. And from what I understand, uh, I mean, you wanted them to kill Lorenzo. And um, you, you made substantial steps and moves to the plan. Up to where you, there's witness testimony that said when you went to Atlanta, you went into the house, you unlocked the window for them. When they went through the window, they found uh, another person to sleep on the couch in there, uh, and and uh, then they left. Um, also, there, there was other attempts that you lured him back to us with uh, sexually explicit text messages, uh, asking him to come back, and that all occurred around the time of his murder. And then you took substantial steps to go clean up the crime scene and to hide evidence. Uh, going so far as to borrow a metal detector uh, to look for shell casings and, and uh, bits of evidence. Is all that true or untrue? What, what, which one do you want me to start on? Because there's parts of, of that that are, I did bring I, I, earlier. I understand what you have in front of you, sir. Uh, okay. However... I did bring Lorenzo to Memphis. I did show the text messages to the guy. I did show. Uh, I did have to do that because he was right there in my face. You have to show me that you are cooperating with me. I did know that there, the, the possibility that he could die from that. I did. I did understand that. And so I was. You're, uh, saying, you're saying it was a possibility he could die. That you're. You're not saying that you. If that the you money was paid. And desired him to be executed for a million dollars. That's not the plot, sir. The, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's not, I understand what you have in front of you. I understand what that looks like. But that money wasn't even set anymore to go to, I personally, I had signed a living will. And the living will that I had signed, well, and I never got to go to trial, so none of this ever got to come up. Um, I took the plea deal because it was just in my best interest because I knew what was being said and I was very depressed about that and I felt like I was responsible for Lorenzo and death in a lot of ways. Number one, I did send those people to his house. I did send them to his house, but I never went inside of his house. I met the pe I picked the children up from the poolside. I never even went inside of the house. Okay. And and so I didn't unlock any windows. That's not true. But I did go to his house, and I did send people to his house. The okay. only reason why I went to the house is because the other children were at the house, and I knew I had sent the people to the house, so I wanted to get the children out of harm's way. Okay. All right. 
Well, at this point, I think we've we've been through the facts of the fence, and I'm sure there'll be more come up uh, through the through the remainder of this hearing. At this point, uh, I'd like to hear from some of your support. Uh, if you would like to say whoever you would like to speak, um, but you, we've got everyone listed on here, and you'll be part of the official record. But again, we're going to allow four to speak, and whoever you'd like to speak, you would come up, state your name, your relationship to the inmate. Take about five minutes and say whatever you'd like to say. Miss Wright, whomever you'd like to, to speak. You get, oh, you get I have four, a so. Well, yeah, well, well, right well, there's more. There's more than four there, so I want you to tell me who you want to come up, and it, it's up to you. Stand up. This is Lorenzen Jr. Hey, Mr. Wright, just, uh, if you just state your name for the record, and uh, I'm, I'm looking down because you're, you're a little taller than the camera here. You can just, yeah, I see, I see, I see, I see. It's cool, it's cool. We, we won't be so foremost to have to have you stand up. You can pull that chair up if you'd like. Uh, uh, I can see you when you're talking. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I just began any way I want to? Just yes, sir, just, just state okay. your name and say whatever you'd like to say. Uh, okay. If you read something, we do ask that you give that uh, to our institutional parole officer there. What he'll do is just copy it, scan it to us. That way we'll have the official record of it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I'm reading. Uh, my little brothers were supposed to be here. They ended up going to Memphis, getting, uh, ended up going to the women's prison in Memphis instead of here on accident this morning. Two brains, one head. Um, I stand uh, I'm going to uh, kind of read from what he wrote because he wants me to kind of read uh, his letter. And then I'll just, I, I, have, I have read that as well, so you can read it for the record. And we do have his, his letter for the record. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Um, starting uh, My name is Lamar Wright. Uh, speaking for my brother. Uh, throughout the history of this case and my mom's uh, conviction for us, um, let me, try, let me try to read this the best way, because I, I kind of have bad handwriting, too, as well. Let me see where we're going. All right. Okay. Um, throughout this case and my mom's condition, uh, it's been very hard for me and my family. Uh, no matter where we go, me and my family have to deal with the history of pretty much what's been going on with my father's death and pretty much trying to navigate our relationship with our mother around other people. Um, I would be lying to say that I didn't mourn my father's death. Um, saying I haven't come to terms with my father's death would be a lie, though, as well. Uh, the older I become, the more I understand about my parents and their trials, just becoming and maturing. Uh, my father was a great man who took the burden of taking care of pretty much his entire family. Not just us, his kids, but his mother, his sisters, cousins, aunties, uncles, nieces, nephews. Uh, the list continues, even people who aren't part of our family. Uh, mentally, I know that was draining for someone like him, you know, uh, just coming from nothing and getting to the point of success where you're in the NBA and now you got all these people who depend on you. And like you said, you just actually getting a taste of that money and getting a taste of that life. Uh, even when I knew he was overwhelmed, my dad was my role model. Even when I knew stuff was to get to him, I know he was frustrated. Even when he had his problems, even when he had his outbursts, his, his certain rages and things like that, I just knew, I knew he had a lot of love now. Um, even with my mom playing a role in my father's death, um, I still had to understand who she is in my life. Um, she is a victim of domestic violence, abuse, whether it is mental, physical, or emotional. Uh, it does not excuse her from the decisions that she's made, and it doesn't take back the time that we've lost from my father. Uh, but I do understand as I become older how much mental trauma, physical abuse, and emotional abuse can do to a person. The years following my father's death, 
you can tell my mom's decisions made her make different changes, different changes in her life. Um, sorry, my handwriting is still a little bad. Uh, I kind of tried to write this in the car on the way here. Uh, well, I think the bad handwriting uh, just is a shot of genius. So it's not good for my writing either. <laughs> okay, so uh, when um, we had no other way or form rather than to point us to God. I feel like when it came down to it, my mom knew she made a lot of mistakes and she didn't really know where to take us and where to go. So she decided to put us in the church, pretty much drown us there. Um, every, every Wednesday, every Sunday, Bible studies, to going to church every Sunday, to praying at night, to praying before we eat. Um, uh, my mom was also at a point to where I knew that her guilt was getting to her. You could tell that she was contemplating suicide and actually hurting herself as well. But there's one word I can't say about my mom. And uh, it took me a while last night. I think I've written like seven letters now. But um, the word for me that I did find that I want to describe her with was perseverance. It's her just being persistent and, and, still, and still going, still going, no matter how hard the situation, no matter how wrong things are going. All my siblings, like, couldn't, could tell that my mom was going a lot. Like, all my siblings could tell that she had so much on her mind. But one thing about her is, you know, she's a fighter. You know, she wants to protect us. You know, she wants to make sure everyone's okay. You know, she, that's been her number one job, is trying to make sure that her kids are okay and make sure that I'm okay. Um, if you want to say one of my most PTSD moments of my life would probably be the day that the God did come to my school and ask me about my father. Um, I was in summer school. I had messed up that year. It was one of my first years actually having to go to summer school, having to get up at 6 a.m. to go to summer school classes at 7 a.m. Uh, she usually had a friend to come get me, and uh, they used to take me to summer school classes, and I usually have to wait after school. I usually wait in the gym or I'll wait outside in the front. Uh, it was a random day at school. You know, it was a car came to school, big black truck. Um, it was two guys, two black guys. I couldn't, uh, if I seen their faces, I probably could have recognized them, but I don't know their names. Uh, one guy holding a gun out the window, and the other one pretty much asking me, hey, boy, where your daddy at? And honestly, I couldn't speak for the first 20 to 30 seconds. I didn't say anything. I just said I didn't know. And they pulled off. First thing I did was, as soon as my mom came to give me, that's the first thing I told her when I got home. The look in her eyes, I could see she was frightened, but you could tell that she was already proactive in mode. She's making phone calls, acting frantic. She didn't really explain to me what was going on. She just told me it was nothing for me to worry about. Now, looking back on it, I wish I could have known more. I, I know as a kid, there's probably nothing I could do. You know, but uh, um, so I kind of just get a little lost. Um, I'm really gonna put the papers up. I'm really just gonna talk. It's just me. Um, there's a lot of things you can say about my mom and my father. They were both together, going through a lot. My mother dealing with losing both her parents from cancer, um, having to lose her daughter from SIDS. Um, like I said, my father's career going up and down. Him, him, his living situation when he was a kid. He used to tell me all the time how. He uh, bounced around when he was a kid. He lived with my grandma, I guess, for a little bit, but then he ended up, I guess, getting taken in by his by his grandma. And he lived with her for a while, if I'm not mistaken. He lived with her. I don't know what the reasons were, but I, I, I know he dealt with, uh, may have dealt with abuse as well when he was a child, just from the way he talked and the way he acted when he used to tell the stories. Um, he eventually ended up moving in with my mom 
when he was moving to Memphis. He moved in with my granddad, my moms, and my father. I guess that was just for the residence, so he could come to Memphis and actually play high school basketball. He ended up eventually transferring and moving in with my granddad, his father, who came into his life a little later on once uh, his life really started to get the rolling and everything started to happen. Um, I just know my dad and my mom dealt with so much growing up and, and, and dealt with so much mentally. And uh, I just know mental health is just so important. I, I know people don't talk about mental health a lot and people don't care about it. Uh, you know, and they may overlook it, but you, when me growing up from being 15 year old kid, seeing my parents, seeing my mom, to me seeing her now at 27, just her going to these classes inside of jail and, and, and her learning different things that she's dealt with, she'll call me and be like, oh, like, I, I didn't even realize that I was dealing with this, like, and this is what I was dealing with, but now I'm in this class, like, it's helped me come to a realization that, you know, come to terms with a lot of things. Like, if you want me to sit here and say, like, oh, I believe 100%, like, my mom, um, like, killed my father, like, uh, I watched the court hearing, and they say she's the one who pulled the trigger, but I'm the one who let my dad outside the door when he had the box of money in his hand. And the reason why I say I know he had a box of money in his hand is because he used to leave a box in the attic all the time. The attic was by my room upstairs. It was somewhere where I used to play a lot all the time. I used to go upstairs, go through his things all the time. I used to go there, play around with his money, take pictures with it. If the police would have took my phone, they would have had records of me with twenty to thirty to forty thousand dollars cash, taking pictures, just fun, making little rap videos with my friends. Um, the night, last night I saw him, he comes down. You know, by my room, knocks on my door. You know, he has the box with him, but, you know, I'm not thinking nothing of the box. He's just having a conversation with me. He's telling me like he usually tells me. You know, him and my mom are having their arguments and things like that. He, he was always the one to come and try to reassure me that he would come back, that they'll get back together. And I think he said something crazy, like, like uh, I'm going to come back and I'm going to buy the house next door. I'm going to move in right next to y'all, you know, because, like, they had just, just finally split up officially. And then... It's just before he left, he just, I just didn't understand what he meant by these words, but he looked me in my face and he was just like, he was like, you know, Snoop, you the man in the house now. And I want you to take care of your mama, your brothers and sisters. And you could, you could you could take those words how you want to take them, but I took them how I took them. And that's what I've been doing. And that's what I'm gonna keep doing. When, when they came to my mom four to five years ago, I decided to step it up. I had to, I had no choice. You know, I felt like that was, she was all I had to have. Well, uh, Mr. Wright, I have uh, been a little, uh, a little lead, give me a little leeway here and, and stay well past the four minutes. We do have a schedule we have to keep on, uh, so, um, would you like to call your your next person up? Miss uh, Miss Wittenberg is gonna come to speak for a moment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Name and uh, your relationship with your name. Speak for about four minutes, please. My name's Angela Wittenberg. I'm a volunteer chaplain here at the prison, but I also have a halfway house and I started recently for women um, who've experienced trauma before prison and after prison, I mean, before and during prison. And our program has accepted Ms. Wright. Um, She's a very good candidate in many ways. Um, I've gotten to know her a little bit through the interview process, and um, her reputation preceded her. She's um, very respected around around DJRC for her effort and her determination to, um, I, I won't say better herself, because I feel like she already had so many um, character qualities that allow her to be a survivor and an overcomer in this environment and in the situations that brought her here. Um, 
I'm not here to talk about what happened at the crime. I don't know anything about that. Okay. Um, what I do know is okay. who she is now. And I wrote her a letter of acceptance based on her character today. And I believe that Deborah Johnson Rehabilitation okay. Center is just that. It rehabilitates people who need healing and, and who have to overcome trauma. And I believe Ms. Wright has done that. I believe she needs an opportunity to do it in the outside world. Um, I believe the incentive has been there all along for her. Her heart has always been about the kids. And we would love to have her be part of our program. Um, is there anything else that you would like? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. This um, is Chrissy Irvin. Good, good morning, Miss Irvin. If you would just state your good name morning. and uh, your relationship with the inmate and say whatever you'd like to say. My name is Chrissy Irby. Uh, my relationship with Cheryl Wright is very close friends. Um, we've been friends over 30 years. Um, I first met Cheryl. Actually, her mom and my mom were best friends. And we met back in 1989. And since that day, we've just been close ever since. Um, during that time, we got to know each other very, very well. Um, she's extremely smart, very talented. Um, she was a big influence on my life and has been and probably will always be a huge influence on my life as well as a lot of other people in our family and friend circle. Um, her kids and my kids are very close. She's actually godfather, I mean godmother to my son. Lorenzo was godfather to my son, um, and we just share the love that we have for each other and our kids. That's how we connect. That's the level that we connect on. Um, I talked to Shara. Uh, we've been talking a lot lately leading up to this um, parole hearing, and one thing I can say is she feels very spiteful because she's not out to love on the people who are most important in her life, which are her kids, her family. Um, she's not able to be that, that, that person that we can all go to and talk to. And she just feels like she's not using her love and that big heart that she has for the reason that she was given. Um, I don't I know for sure that she's not a threat to society. Um, one thing that really surprised me was when she told me that she's, she's become very interested in IT. That's something that she's never, ever, that was never a career that I saw her getting into. She never even knew how to type for a long time. And that was just an ongoing joke in the family but she's really taken to um, IT and, and getting her, um, getting into that career field um, and eventually um, getting a job in that field. And I'm sure that she will. Um, mm -hmm. Her brother will be a huge help because he um, has a very um, vast knowledge of that field. So. I'm sure she won't have a problem um, becoming whatever it is that she wants to become in that field. Um, her kids adore her. We adore her. We miss her. Um, we need her in our lives. Um, she's just like the missing puzzle to everything. Um, and I can't speak on anything that happened um, regarding Mr. Wright's death, but I do know that they loved each other. They, we call them peas and carrots. It, it, it's, if you saw her, you saw him, they loved each other. Yes, they had a tumultuous relationship. Yeah, there were fights, you know, there was a physical abuse. I saw it. 
I was I was privy to many incidents where that happened, but she always wanted to protect him. She always wanted to keep her family together, and she always wanted to make sure that he was okay. Um, and for that, a lot of people looked up to them as a couple. They looked up to them as ha wanting to have that same love that they had for one another. And that love went on for a long time. When she first met Lorenzen, Lorenzen was 17 years old. And to the day he left this earth, they were together throughout everything that happened in their lives. So I think that strength, um, that loyalty that they had for one another, the love that they had for one another, um, just it just counts out any any all the other you know just bad things that happened in their relationship. So just speaking on her behalf, I really feel that Ms. Wright will be better out loving, taking care of her kids, helping them become better human beings because since she's been here, I've just been amazed at how mature, how loving, how responsible her kids are throughout all of this. And I know all of that came from the love and the attention that she gave them. I mean, they stepped up to the plate and took care of each other in no way that I would have ever thought they could. Thank you. All right. Ms. Wright, you have uh, one more that you can call up. My daughter, Lauren. Okay. Hello. Good, My name good is morning. Lauren Wright. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> My siblings didn't want me to speak because they thought I would cry, so I'm going to prove them wrong. Um, I would just like to start off and say that I wouldn't be where I was today without my mom. Um, I'm the oldest daughter of my, obviously my parents, and I've had to take this role of being a mother for the past, you know, five years, I think. So I was 19 years old when she got arrested. Um, ever since then, I've been a mother figure to my sister and my younger brothers. Um, and all I got to say is, I don't know how she does it because I'm it's, it's hard. Um, when I think about my, my mom, I think about all the love that she gave us when we were kids and all the things that she would do for us in order to make us be better people. I mean, we have my older brother graduated basketball. He did basketball college with a degree. Me, I'm a licensed nurse. A specialty is mental health, mental health and earth. And in school for my bachelor's in nursing. The twins are in college for psychology, criminal justice. My younger brother is in school for the computer science. My little sister is 15. She just made the freshman volleyball team this week. So everything that goes on in our life is all because of her. Um, I love my dad. I love daddy a lot. Um, I would say that I was probably closest with him because he was a he was a girl dad, most people would say. He was a girl dad. And when I think about my childhood, you know, I had a great childhood. Everything was amazing until the last couple of years. Like, I can remember getting woken up at 2 a.m. with no, with no, with nothing said to me, just saying, hey, let's go. We got to go. We'd wake up in the middle of the night. No bags packed and we have to leave. Um, I've seen domestic violence. I would myself, and I've conf I've talked to my I talked to my dad about it, and it was one of those things that I've just been so adamant about. Um, since mommy's been in jail, um, I've always I started mental health nursing as soon as I graduated college. I always said I would never do it, and then I got a job in California, and I was like I clung to it. And as soon as she got there, I remember telling her, hey. You, you have some mental health things that need to be addressed. You have some trauma. You have some, 
you have a lot of things that need to be addressed. And she was in denial at first. She was like, oh, you know, I don't think I need that. No, I'm good. I'm good. And she was in denial for a long time. There's been so many arguments that I've had with her telling her, like, you need to get this addressed. You, you know, throwing her out a DSM of all these things that I think could, you know, could be in a cause of this and this and this. So it's amazing being able to see the progression of then and now. You know, she'll call me and tell me, hey, I just finished this domestic violence class. And hey, you know, they have me on this medication, but I stopped taking it. And there's a lot of things that I'm just seeing so much progression and so much growth. There's so much that she's learned since she's been here. And I just know that she has so much um, that she can do outside. Our family needs her. I. I'm not going to say that I can't do it, but I'm not her. I'm not, I'm not mommy. So, um, I don't know. I just, I can never say much, much bad about her. She was a mother to all my friends, our boyfriends, our girlfriends. My, every, every child growing up is her, is her, is her kid. And she's always been that way. She's always been caring. She's always been loving. She's always been our mom. And that's always been her job title. You know, she never really worked when I was growing up. So that's also a thing that Chrissy was saying that it's kind of cool seeing her come out here and say, hey, like, I want to take up computer because she's so smart. She graduated top 10 of, of, of high school. She, she's about to graduate, I'm pretty sure, valedictorian of college that she's in now. I mean, I can never do that, and she's able to do that while she's here, and that's just a, a huge achievement in my eyes. So, um, my words, I can say, my piece that I'll give is, um, I wouldn't be here without her. Um, everyone is supposed to be forgiven and should be forgiven for whatever actions. Nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. No one, no one is. Um, so. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. All right. Well, that concludes um, for testimony. And now we're going to go uh, to Memphis and hear from the opposite. I just want to remind everyone in opposition to please address all comments to me and board. And, and please don't comment to the inmates. But simply address uh, the Tennessee Board of Parole. And if you would just state your name and your relationship to the victim, and you may, uh, may take uh, up to four or five minutes. I think it's still morning. I don't want to watch it. Too poor. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's just a little after 10. But I want to tell you about a story, a story of two families. Oh, sir, sir, we need, we need Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Lorenzo Cersei Jr. I, Deborah Marion is my niece. The young okay. uh, man and woman that was there, they're also my niece and nephew. But as I said, I want to tell you a story about two families torn apart by a vicious, malicious act. The death of my nephew. That has torn families apart. I have seen my niece agonize for ten, over 10 years about the death of her son. She would never let her son die on his birthday in the middle of Memphis, Tennessee, right at the FedEx Forum. She had a, a rally every year so no one would forget that Lorenzo Wright was killed. I think today in listening to everything that has been said, now the kids, I know the kids are sincere in what they say, but I also believe that even they think their mother did something wrong. And there's no doubt about the record, yes, she did something wrong. I personally don't think she served enough time for her act. I was a United States Marine for a little over 24 and a half years. I went to Vietnam. I've seen Thanks death. You, You're very welcome. I've seen death, malicious death, violent death. 
but the act that took my nephew out of this world was unbelievable. That was just total evil. There is no way to describe it other than evil. And if you, the parole board, let her out now, no way. She has not had enough time to sit down, contemplate, and realize what she did. She's smart. She's smart. There's not a doubt about that. Because where she is right now, she's smart. That's it for me. Thank you, sir. Okay, who else, who else would like to speak? I am Deborah Marion, and I'm Lorenza's mother. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> After this murder, what was really bad was my grandkids. They didn't know what to do. They went from a daddy missing to a daddy found dead. So they were like, you know, not knowing what to do. And then we lead up to facts. They heard the facts about their mother, Lou, and their daddy. They heard the facts about their mother going to, to Georgia to, you know, to make sure he got killed. And that's what was really crazy, that the facts that actually came out, you know, about them sitting around the dining room table planning the murder. You know, I don't get, I don't, what part of that don't they understand? And my grandkids suffer, they haven't had any counseling. They just act like they can just keep going on. They need counseling. Their mother killed their father. Can't nobody explain that to them. They need counseling. And I, I hope they one day get some, because all of them need some form of counseling. Because that's devastating. My mother killed my daddy, so I don't have a mother or a daddy. That ain't good. And I think she need to stay there for her term. I'm doing life, so she need to do just 30. I don't want her to do but 30. That's it. And she can come on home and be with her kids. Because you hear how they talk, she have even manipulated them to the core. Because a lot of stuff that was told to me, it just got twisted up today. And I can, like, so you can look at them, tell what you can look at the newspaper and find. You can look at the newspaper and find they said that the guy approached Lawson. Not Lorenzen Jr., Lawson. Look at the commercial appeal. That's easy said than done. You can just open up paper. See, the kids still kind of messed up because they haven't got the real realm of what's really, really going on because I know they love their mother and they want her to come home just because she's their mother. But if she was the neighbor next door that planned to kill their dad, it wouldn't have went like this. No, and that's why I think she didn't do with 30. She don't need to do with 30. You can let her come home in 30. I just need for her to do what she did and pay for it. You know, that's why society is so messed up now. You can cop a plea and run through the prison and come on home. No, not today. Not in 2022. We need to do something about it. We need to make a change. Because they plea, that's, that's not even good plea. I'm going to plea that I, don't, I say I'm sorry. I, I don't even say I'm sorry. I just say I sit in my dining room and plan this murder, y'all. I'm telling y'all I did it. So that's a plea for me. What is that? That's not good. It, you know, you get no, less time just because you say, yes, I did it. That's not, that's not real. No, we need time, people to serve time so everybody around can pay attention. That's why somebody's dying every day in Memphis, Tennessee, just caught on the news. Because they're not getting no time. They running through the system. Please, I'm guilty. I did this. Now send me to prison for a little minute. No, that don't work. She need to do time. I'm, I'm doing life without my child. So I want her to feel like I feel. Left out, lost and left out. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Who else would like to speak? Yes, sir. I'm Sergeant Tony Parks with the Miss Police Department. I was one of the leading investigators on this case. Uh, throughout this investigation, I learned <clears throat> how deceitful and mis uh, misleading and manipulative that uh, Sheriff could be. <clears throat> sir, sir, first of all, um, you are not. Uh, a member of the victim's family? No. Okay, so you are a in, you're a law enforcement uh, official yes, uh, who investigates the case. Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm just there's something a little a little bit different right here. Uh, law enforcement our rules allow law enforcement sentencing judge and district attorney to speak. I just want to make sure there's no other family members. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. All right, if there's no other family members, with well, that said, now we're going to hear from uh, law enforcement. 
that is here. Also, and if you would just, yes, sir. All right. We do have another uh, opposition uh, person who would like to speak here. Oh, in Nashville. In Nashville. Okay. okay. Yes. Then we will move that opposition. Hello, my name is Zaddy Vassar. I am Lorenzo's right aunt. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Um, I haven't been to any of the trials before because I can't deal with this. Now, everybody grabbing tissue, I'm going to need some because I might cry about this because I've been crying for 10 years. My nephew would still be here if they hadn't facilitated him being dead. So I'm, 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 I'm done with that part. This is my part about this. My nephew would still be here. These kids would still have their mom if this didn't go down like this. I don't think she served enough time because she didn't think about this. She didn't think about her kids when she did it. They didn't think about this when it all went down. They didn't think about anything but the money when it all went down because that's all they got out of it was a million dollars. So to me, the time has not been served because my nephew would never be back. These kids would never have their father, ever, ever. They're going to get their mother back one day, but they will never have their father. I would never have my nephew. And a lot of the stuff they said that I heard today is so untrue because I saw my nephew every other day. I lived right around the corner from my nephew. And his townhouse, the interest is on the front yes, it is. when you drive up. So there is an interest and there is a window. So all that, all that was a lie. The drugs, I don't know where it came from. I see my nephew every other day, if not every day. He called me every day. I lived by, I was the last person probably in my family to talk to him from Atlanta. I was the one that called his mom and said, go look for your son, because something is wrong. I don't think it's time served. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, so we have heard from three, three family members. And now, um, I believe it's law enforcement that we're going to hear from. You ready now? Yes, sir. If, okay. you, if you would like to, if you would just state your name, yeah, I got you. uh, and, and rank and, and who you're with, and right. then give us a little background about why you're here, and then say if you'd like to say, sir. All right, thanks. I'm Sergeant Tony Parsons with the Miss Police Department, but there's a gang unit. Um, the reason I'm here on behalf of Miss Marion, called her Miss D, she asked me to come speak on behalf of uh, the investigation in the case. Uh, throughout this investigation, it was learned, you know what I'm saying, that, you know, Sharon can be very deceiving and manipulative. Um, the way she sells it, presents everything is, is the, what she's doing now. <clears throat> throughout this investigation, all the facts and details she had today, why were these facts presented when we was trying to question her back then, okay? But that being said, um, I don't understand how all the details, all the books, the stories, the concern about her well-being now. There was no reports filed back then. There was nothing done back then to help to, to get prevent this point from even happening. If all that was done back then, then we wouldn't even be sitting at this table because counsel would have been done, everything would have been fine and moved on. But now all this is going on to make somebody like she's ready to get back to society. No, she's not ready to get back to society. For a mother to sit back and plot and plan to kill the father of their children, six children, not going to never see their father again, that is very, very manipulative. That is very deceitful to do that. And then, as you asked her earlier, and she is that, she said directly but indirectly, she said she was involved. She admitted herself then. So if you didn't admit that you admitted to kill your father back then, then you're not ready to get back to society because you still, at the time, your mental capacity was not ready, and you're not mental capacity not ready now because you're still trying to, as I say, sell us beach from a problem in Alaska. It's not right. Something's not right about that. If the evidence was, if she presented some of this back then, we'd investigate and went from there to see. But it wasn't the drug aspect. When she first asked, she didn't know anything, didn't hear anything. The, the 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 brutal way that he was left out there, and to know if he was anybody in his room, you do anything for your children, and to know that you're going to take your child's father away from your children in the future, there's something wrong with you. So with that being said, I don't care how many classes you take, how many times you try to take classes, whatever you try to do, you you four or five years are not going to get you decided because now you're confined. So now you have to come up with something to get out. But when you was out, after he had murdered, you didn't want to buy the house, you didn't move to California, you'd have party when the money ran out, now all of a sudden there's an issue. 
So you wasn't that thoughtful about the kids then when you was out before you got caught. But now when you're caught and you're incarcerated, now all of a sudden you have to go to all these classes, you're trying to do all this to make yourself better and go to all these schools and everything. I just, I just don't, I don't think she's ready to get out. And, and I, just, I just think that even the, I don't know when the next parole hearing is, it should bypass them and go to another one because four to five years and, and then she's trying to even add on more time from the time when we got her 2018, when she was rest after her son's basketball game that night, after the game, we had a stop and traffic stop then, trying to add that time on to it. It, it, it didn't start then. It starts now, and then 10 to 50, 20 years from now, like Ms. D said, 30 years from now, then that's when I think that you should be able to know that, hey, look, I did wrong and everything. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. I believe we have the district attorney general here present for uh, the, the district that comes to Shelby County. Uh, if you just state your name and your position and whatever you'd like to say to us for the record, General. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rich. Amy Wyrick, District Attorney General for Shelby County. The Board of Parole has my letter that was sent on behalf of the District Attorney's Office in opposition to this hearing that we find ourselves <laughs> at. Yeah. Yes. And it's frustrating enough in the district attorney's office on cases of this magnitude, cases that involve this violence, cases that involve the taking of women's sons, of men's nephews, of fathers. It's frustrating enough to have to then turn around and appear at a parole hearing so quickly. 30 years should mean 30 years. But we find ourselves here today Adding to the frustration is the manipulation, the deceit, and the deflection from Cheryl Wright. It would have been, I think, difficult for the board to make a decision here had she appeared and owned up to what everyone in this room knows to be true, to what she admitted to when she accepted her guilty plea, and to what the whole nation knows about her conduct. It would have been a difficult decision for you and your colleagues to make had she come in and said, I'm sorry, I did this. Greed and evil got the better of me. But instead what we heard today was more of what she is the master of, manipulation. It's been described here today that she is a survivor, and there is no doubt about that. And her focus today is what is best for her. My focus as district attorney is on public safety. My focus as district attorney is on the victim's family that sits here with me today, that is there in Nashville. And what they have been through should mean something. Victims in the state of Tennessee need to believe in our criminal justice system. It is outrageous to even be present at this hearing given that she served, or pled rather, to 30 years and has served a little less than five years. The seed that was planted in her brain to kill Lorenzen Wright and the steps and the conversation and the text messaging and the plotting and the planning, the trips to Atlanta, the scheming, the conniving, not to mention everything that she was involved in after he was killed. That, General, yes, can, I, can, I, can I just interrupt you just for a minute? Um, generally speaking, uh, I prefer a, a nice statement uh, as to tell me why you oppose parole, but there, seems to be some dispute or maybe uh, a little bit of softening of the facts here. And I know what I've read here in the facts of the offense. However, uh, she pled guilty to this crime instead of going to trial. And so therefore, we don't have a, a long court record. Can you give me, I mean, tell me what she did that the, the real facts that you have that she pled guilty to so that I may know that without a doubt. Yes, sir. Lorenzen Wright would be alive today but for her greed. She wanted him dead for the money. And she took the steps, many of which you've outlined, and I hope that you have the, 
uh, file that our office sent to the board that outlines these facts. And I certainly don't want to misspeak or omit something. If I could perhaps turn to the law enforcement experts here who invested this case from the beginning. But we do know that she is the reason that Lorenzen Wright is dead. And the only reason that he was killed was because he was a successful basketball player who had, was worth a lot dead. And she wanted that money and needed that money. But these allegations and these claims of domestic abuse and other things, it's the first anyone is hearing of it. And to sit there and to plot and plan this manipulative murder and take the steps that she did, um, going the trip to Atlanta, that, that's all part of the case record. The trip and the leaving the window open and trying and practicing and failing at that attempt. But the energy that she expended to make sure he was dead probably took longer than she's actually served yet on this crime. And it is the humble opinion of this district attorney and the citizens of this community that she should have to serve the sentence to which she pled guilty to. But I will turn to Sergeant Parks or Sergeant Brownlee for any specific facts that you need. Well, it's specific, more specifically, General, I've got a set of facts and circumstances here that are given to me um, by the state, which the Department of Correction houses as the official record. Uh, the summary of facts and circumstances is exactly what it's called. Uh, then I'll outline and have several questions. Uh, Ms. White seems to uh, believe that some of them are in dispute, and I just wanted to hear the other side and hear uh, your is are they in dispute or, or are they factual as you know? They are factual as we know it, sir, and those were the facts, and this investigation, remember, took years. Um, for the police department and other law enforcement agencies to solve this murder was not an easy task. And her opportunities at every juncture from the moment Lorenzen Wright's body was found, the opportunities that she had to assist were many. But instead she chose to deflect and to lead law enforcement down unsuccessful and dead-end paths, again in an attempt to deflect and minimize her involvement and her desire and, to have him killed. And it seems like that uh, there was a, it was kind of stated that, uh, and maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but I just want to get it right. And that is that she had a life insurance policy, or there's a life insurance policy on the victim. And uh, that policy was paid out, and maybe she was, that was proceeds were used to pay off some debt that the defendant owed in order to keep her family safe? Am I misinterpreting what was said? And is yes. that correct? What's, what, I mean, is that how, is there any dispute on how that was spent? Was it the federal old stores or what, what, or debts or what happened here? No, if I could let Sergeant Parks, he is on the insurance On the insurance part, she you bought. Just, just state your name again, boys. Sergeant Tony Parks. Uh, and what on the initial initial part, she went and bought a house out in Reed Hooker with some of the money. And then when that house there foreclosed, and she moved out and took the money and she bought cars and everything. That was on the initial investigation back in 2010 when we assisted then. But that's before we picked up investigation in 2017. So that insurance okay. money was, was, of course, was uh, received from her, but it was not used to pay off some drug that she was referring to. She went and bought a, house, a home out there for Reed Hooker. And then other and other things as far as cars and everything else. Well, and, and I understand these. these I, I try not to read anything in the news, yes. articles, no, or our, our uh, media who does a work job presenting these or presenting the facts. Uh, but I'm looking at this this thing based on the record here and what's being told there, so that I can make a decision based on what is being told to me today. And so I do have those questions. Um, but just reading through here, I've, I've seen a couple of things that just make me want to ask if that was right and make sure that the, the facts that I'm hearing from Ms. Wright's side and your side are, are all being, um, no matter what to say, been, been flushed out for us to all hear. There is very little that the state would agree with that has come from Shara Wright's mouth today other than the fact that Lorenzen Wright, a beloved member of this community, was murdered. And we're not here to relitigate the case. However, we are here to look at aspects of retributive justice and uh, to see if the crime that was committed 
had any mitigating circumstances or aggravating circumstances uh, so that you know how to apply to it. So thank you very much. Uh, you. Anyone else? Law enforcement official. Um, I'm Detective Jesse Brown with the Memphis Police Department. I'm a detective for the Memphis Police Department. We don't have your sign-in sheet here. We just need to get that. I can, he came after the hearing started, so I can get him to sign-in okay. and scan it. Okay, thank you. All right, can you just spell your name for us? State your name and spell it. It's um, Jesse. And if you want. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. All right, Jesse Browning. It's going to be J-E-S-S-E. B R O W N I N G. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Uh, just take a couple of minutes and say what whatever you uh, whatever's on your mind. I can just follow up on the general that I mean, the fact that Miss Wright planned and prepared to execute this murder from the end of 2009 all the way to July of 2010, and then carry out this murder for the sole purpose of monetary gain is is just I mean, it's gut-wrenching. And then on top of that, to come here today and see her tell a complete lie all the way through and not accept responsibility, I mean, to me, that just shows that she's probably still a danger to society. That, I mean, because if she can't accept responsibility for her actions that she did then, which the facts that we laid out led to a co-conspirator getting a life sentence, she can't even accept the responsibility and say that she's sorry for her actions. I mean, to me that says that if she gets out, she's going to continue to be manipulative and a danger to society. And so, so you can prove beyond reasonable doubt that she did the things that are in the report? We were, yes, yes. we were prepared to get a trial for that. And we did with her co-conspirator and he got a life sentence. Yes, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right, that being the case, we have heard from the opposition. We have heard from the, uh, law enforcement. We've heard from the district attorney general. We've heard from the support. That's right. Now's the time where you're given one of the fundamental rights of our criminal justice system, our even guarantees, and that's the right to be heard. At this point in the hearing, I'm going to give you the opportunity to say anything you'd like to say to the board, but I wanted to specifically address why you believe you should be granted the privilege of parole. Yes, sir. There, there are a lot of things uh, that I could have done differently during that time, and I am taking full responsibility for leading people to where he was staying in Atlanta. I am taking full responsibility for that. I am taking full responsibility for setting up the meeting on the 18th that eventually led to his death. I am taking full responsibility for lo losing over $4.5 million of income in a year and then not trying to deter him from making illegal money because I didn't want to lose my, li my lifestyle. And so I could have deterred him and did things differently. Um, that also affected the children. They had to come out of their private schools and things of that nature. It was um, a hard time for our family. And I could have did some things different. It was really hard telling Lorenzo no, though. It, that's one of my hardest things that I've ever had to face is, and I learned that in boundaries class, how to now say no. And um, I think that's going to take me a long way in life, and I wish I would have had that skill during that time in my life, but I did not. Um, and being totally codependent upon him, that was a difficult thing to say. Um, I want to say that when you hire an attorney, it's not much that you can say. You can't give any information in an investigation. You can't say anything. Uh, when I asked in open court at the time of my plea, was I able to address anything that was being said? I was told by the judge only if my attorneys allowed me, and at that point, no one allowed me. Um, there were things going on when I, before I took the plea, there were things happening around me. There were things happening to the children, and they're all present today. My daughter's home was, uh, and car was, uh, uh, someone went into her car, went into her house, uh, tried to get into her house. People were still 
um, trying to keep me quiet in this case. So some of these things haven't been said because it was not safe to do so. And during the time of the murder, my kids just weren't safe and I was trying to get them to be safe. If that's, um, no matter how that's looked at, that was my uh, number one goal. And I had, like my friend said, I had lost my baby and the only thing I could think of was, I'm not gonna lose another child under my watch. And that just, I, I don't think I'd be able to live with myself. Um, my decisions were altered. My thinking was skewed. Um, I was looking for physical solutions to spiritual problems, things that um, I could have been praying about and doing things differently, but my focus, um, I was just living my whole life out of fear during that time. Watching the children grow up uh, without their dad, it's been devastating. And I've cried a lot of nights watching his extended family, and especially his mother, because at some point in my life, um, that was the only mother that I had because my mom was gone. I, I respected Lorenz's mom, but for people to, um, you know, pretend like there was no abuse when many times I went to her as a mom and um, asked for help for him during the suicide of times when the finances were, were not so good. I went to his father and I asked and I pled for him. And when our house was raided by the feds, because it was one of our homes was raided by the feds, I, went, I reached out to them. I need somebody to help us. I need somebody to step in and talk to him. But everybody wanted to pretend like it wasn't happening because I was the only one left holding that bag. And no, I didn't handle the situation properly, but because I was making split second rash decisions during that time. But I do want to say that I'm sorry for what happened to him. I'm sorry because he's not here. I'm sorry that my kids don't have a daddy and his mom doesn't have a son and they don't have a niece and, and his, I mean, he, they don't have their uncle and their their nephew and all the people that I consider to be my family. I didn't want to see anybody hurt the way they're hurt right now. And I didn't want to ever, ever in my life be without him because he was the love of my life. I just made bad decisions because I was scared. And that's, and if you look into my discovery package, there's information about that per person on that document that I sent you. And that person made a confession on that particular night. And that particular night, the night of the murder, he made a confession to his wife that he said he got $100,000 for killing Ren when she asked him where the money came from. And I think that that's something that shouldn't have been overlooked. And I, and I do understand that I could have, I, I, I wept, withheld information for the police, from the police, but part of that was due to the fact that I could not talk unless my attorney brought forth those facts because I wasn't able to talk to them directly. I wasn't able to talk to them directly. After you hire an attorney, you cannot talk to them unless the attorney talks to them. And I never went to trial, so no, some of these facts didn't come out. But these are facts. However, these are real facts. Um, I've done a lot since I've been here. I feel like it's been a divine appointment. Just like my kids have said, I've learned a lot. I've taken so many classes. I've taken every class on the compound. There's no other class uh, for me to take except for career management services. And they said that the parole board has to mandate you to take that particular class. Um, I do stand to become valedictorian of my national state um, at the end of the year and and in CIT I graduate like I said in two or three weeks. June the first is our graduation date and I'm graduating with a nine ninety eight point two average, which is the highest average in her class as well. I have done a lot of done I've demonstrated my devotion to growth. I'm a low risk offender and um I've dealt with my anxiety and my depression issues. I went to mental health. I did everything I was asked to do. I took my medications and recently um, I'm not even on any medications. I haven't taken any medications since last year. Uh, and so all of my counselors are proud of me. Um, and the, for the first time in my life in, in the last 25 years, 
in 25 years, I haven't been able to make gainful employment to take care of my children, and now I'm able to do that, and I'm actually proud of that. Um, I do have a lot of support. I have a very supportive husband now. He's a military veteran, a disabled military veteran, and his doors are open, and he supported me with the transitional housing, saying, well, babe, if you feel like that's the best thing for you, right now I'm still going to stand beside you, whatever you want to do. Uh, I've known him for over 30 years. Um, I have a great church family, and I'm, today I want to be honest, I'm embarrassed by this crime. I'm embarrassed by how low I stooped or how low um, I watched him, you know, go, because he was this great big person in the community and we stood in front of the cameras with that platform that we had and with that platform we did nothing but deceive the whole community and to think that we were this perfect couple with no problems and all the time all this illegal stuff was going on behind the scenes and I don't fault Lorenzo for it because I love him and because I understood that he had to make up the difference but when he quit playing for the Grizzlies I mean, we lost $4.5 million worth of income, and if he had a lived, sir, he would have been playing for the Houston Rockets because he, tried, he had just tried out for them, and he was looking at a three-year deal. So it's no way in the world I would have took that away from him because as his wife or his ex-wife, I still was entitled to half of that. And just one more thing I want to tell you is that well, right before Lorenzo died, there was a company called Hartford Life Insurance Company, and that was a $5 million policy, and I was the sole beneficiary of that policy. And when Lorenzen got into trouble, the only reason why he had half of the money to repay the debt was I asked him, let's get the cash value out of this policy so you can pay these people, and that's what we did. And that's all I want to say today, and I want to let you know that I understand that parole is a privilege, and it is not something that I have to receive or something that I should receive. And I just, I'm asking today for your mercy, and I'm asking that you just read in between the lines or just listen to everything that's been said, and I want to thank you for the, uh, the opportunity, if I'm given a second chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Give me just one moment, and I'll be back with my yes, vote. Sir. an excellent prison record um, you have done very well here I believe you have a support system that could help you in the free world uh, you have done an excellent job while in prison and you're even a low risk strong arm for justice for the victims, to prevent others and deter others from committing similar crimes, and to keep our state safe and the citizens of our state safe, and hopefully provide some closure for victims. I think it's abhorrent, a uh, near abomination that you're up for parole on these crimes in such a short period of time. The parole board has nothing to do with scheduling uh, this time. And under the sentence where you, uh, under the year where you were sentenced, uh, your good time came off of the front of your sentence instead of the back. And I believe the state of Tennessee legislature has addressed that 
and now good time only comes off the back of the sentence, therefore not reducing uh, your bringing you up for parole even earlier. Uh, you're not even eligible for parole uh, under any kind of parole until 2025. So um, I see no, I don't see any kind of reason um, that early release would be justified in any matter. Uh, there is a retributive justice aspect to these types of crimes, and uh, you did plead guilty to facilitation, which is a lesser offense than uh, should all the facts be put together for first degree murder, uh, which could be a life sentence. You were given uh, a pretty good plea agreement, it looks like. Uh, therefore, uh, my vote today is to deny your parole due to the seriousness of the offense because I believe release from custody at this time would appreciate the seriousness of the crime and hear you again yes, on uh, in May of 2027, which would be nearly the 30% mark of the original plea agreement. That is my vote and my vote only. The other board members may review your, will review your case and they will each vote administratively at the required number of votes to reach. Once those required number of votes are reached, you'll be notified if you've been granted or not paroled. Thank you all today. This hearing is complete. Thank you.